34 has now finally arrived. From knockouts to tap outs. Inside the octagon and beyond. Is this not real now? Are we pretending? We're rich, baby. Break out the red panties. This is the MMA Report with John Pollock. Unbelievable! Here we go! Welcome to the MMA Report. I am your host, John Pollock, with you for another week on the show. We've got a fun one coming up. It's a quieter week in mixed martial arts, as this coming weekend, there's no UFC event. Bellator has a card on Friday in Belfast, Northern Ireland, that has had many changes to its main event over the past week. We will get you caught up on that. But it gives us a chance to uh, look ahead to a number of different stories that are occurring at this time in mixed martial arts. And next weekend, not going to be the case where it's a quiet one. Not only will we have a Bellator card on Friday night, we have UFC 209 next weekend. And it's an event that isn't going to get the same kind of promotion and attention as those two. But next Saturday night on March the 4th, It's going to be the final Hook and Shoot card that Jeff Osborne will be running. Hook and Shoot is a promotion that dates back over 20 years. They were pivotal in the development of so many different fighters, but in particular, the rise and a platform for women's mixed martial arts. Before there was Elite XC or Strike Force or even the UFC, for that matter, promoting women, it was Hook and Shoot. It was Jeff Osborne running the first all-women show in 2002. Uh, He is a pioneer, and that's a term that you hear a lot in mixed martial arts, but it is apropos of how you would describe Jeff Osborne, former broadcaster at the UFC. We're going to chat with him about his decision to give up promoting and the legacy that Hook and Shoot leaves behind. Uh, There were many important figures that came through that promotion, and this was... This was a company based out of Evansville, Indiana, that ran for two decades. They were never on national television. They were never on pay-per-view, but they were a profitable company right up until his most recent show. And we're going to get into uh, discussing just the state of mixed martial arts, the business of running a mixed martial arts promotion when you don't have national television, and just the viability that Jeff sees. One of the smartest individuals i feel that has promoted mixed martial arts he has also fought in another lifetime he was a professional wrestler at one point uh it's going to be a fun chat to have jeff osborne on the program later plus we are going to be joined by brandon gertz who is going to be fighting on the bellator main card next friday night in thackerville oklahoma he has a real incredible story this is someone who tore his acl a number of years ago then last year, right around this time last year, tore his ACL again in his right knee, and he ended up having to go through the entire process from scratch. Not all that different uh, from what Dominic Cruz had to go through as well, where you go through the entire rehab, the arduous process of rehabbing a torn ACL, and then it happens again. The fact that he came back and fought last November... Think about that. He tears his ACL at the beginning of 2016, and he fights by November, uh, which is incredible in and of itself. Went three rounds with Adam Piccolotti, dropped the decision, and now returns to fight. He's going to be taking this fight on relatively short notice and therefore doing it at 170 pounds to get a fight in to start off the year, taking on Fernando Gonzalez. But it's a really remarkable story of his comeback and where he is setting his sights Uh, within Bellator as someone that has been competing with the organization going all the way back to 2012. So two really engaging guests coming up over the next hour. Looking forward to chatting with them. Uh, But first, let's rewind to last weekend because there was a lot of action to discuss. First up on Saturday night, it was Bellator 172, which was a cursed event. If you were planning to tune in last Saturday night, it was unfortunate news that came out just hours before the card was set to go live that Matt Mitrione was out of the main event with Fedor Emelianenko, suffering from a kidney stone that he couldn't pass and was hospitalized. He was hooked up and the call was made that Matt Mitrione could not fight and the fight was off for Saturday night. So with just hours to spare, they ended up moving Josh Thompson and Patricky Pitbull Freite into that main event slot. And it looks like they're going to rebook Fedor Emelianenko and Matt Mitrione for a later date. That certainly seems to be the fight that Fedor wants 
And it's a fight that Matt Mitrione wants, and he's in a big rush to get back and fight after this. He was able to pass that kidney stone. But in speaking with Ariel Hawani earlier this week, the doctors informed him he has something like six or seven kidney stones inside that need to be taken care of. And he was set to go uh, for an operation uh, this Wednesday, uh, the results of which I'm not aware of at this point. Hopefully it went fine and they were able to uh, get rid of those kidney stones. It sounded like an absolutely awful procedure if you heard this interview with Ariel and Matt Mitrione. Uh, but it, it left for a bit of a, a hollow evening for Bellator. I mean, this was a card that I mean, 95% of the interest was surrounding that main event. Yes, you had Josh Thompson returning. Josh Koscheck was also fighting on this card. But, I mean, the bulk of this card, it was built around Matt Mitrione and Fedor Emelianenko. And, you know, there were some names that came up as possible last-minute substitutions that could fight Fedor on short notice. I, I, I've spoken about this in the past, but it's just – it's this mentality we've had in mixed martial arts for a long time where the immediate concern is – or the reference point is something like uh, Elite XC, their heat event in 2008 where Ken Shamrock falls out of the fight with Kimbo Slice that day and Seth Petruzzelli steps in to fight Kimbo Slice. A fight that turned out to be a disaster for the company on many different fronts, which you could do a whole show on that that card and its fallout. But this idea that these fighters are so interchangeable that a fighter will spend eight weeks preparing for one given opponent and then that fighter, their opponent falls out and we're expected on eight hours notice to take a new opponent who may be a completely different fighter. It. I'm all for trying to preserve a show and make the fans happy, but expectation needs to be reeled in when the the idea is just throwing a brand new opponent at Fedor, for instance. I don't want to hear any complaints about Fedor not taking a last-minute opponent. I think we have come too far and should respect the um, the level of talent that is in this sport that requires preparation, that requires strategy, that requires those eight weeks of training for one given opponent to give that fighter the best opportunity for an outcome. This is a sport at the highest level, and it's not just mix and match opponents and flip a coin. I know that there is a romantic nostalgia to fighters that will fight anyone, anytime, on any notice. But when we were talking about the major leagues of MMA, and I include Bellator as a major league MMA promotion, it's just unrealistic. And I will never fault a fighter for not taking a last minute replacement opponent. And for people out there to be screaming about Matt Mitrione, it's like, shut up. It's so, it's not even worth addressing that segment of the audience. So I'm sure I'm annoying somebody that's listening to this that uh, disagrees with me. But those are my thoughts on this. It's just we are at a point in mixed martial arts where it's not the days of even 2008. It's evolved to a – this is a mature sport. This is, this is a sport that has come a long way. And I just – I don't look at this anymore. I, I feel opponents that are – put into the situations where they have to take an opponent on several days notice look at Liam McGeary this week we can get into that right now he went from a week ago preparing for Chris Fields to Fields is hurt and in comes Vladimir Filipovich who then has visa issues and now it is Brett McDermott from our friends at Severe MMA reporting those constant changes to the Belfast card for Bellator this Friday night insanity I mean, yes, you favor Liam McGeary over these three respective fighters. Nevertheless, Liam McGeary loses to one of these fighters. I mean, that's detrimental to him at this point as someone that is trying uh, to regain his footing after just losing the Bellator light heavyweight title. It is certainly a part of the game. And hey, if you can save a fight, great. If if the guy is willing to fight on short notice, awesome. But I'm never going to hold that against a guy. And we get an, an outcome like we did Saturday where, sorry, we don't have a main event. It sucks. It was unfortunate. It took a lot of steam out of that card. Nonetheless, they did produce 807,000 people tuning in with over a million hitting the peak number for the main event with Patricky Pitbull and Josh Thompson with Patricky stopping Thompson. And now... That lightweight picture for Bellator would appear to be a rematch with Michael Chandler and Patricky Pitbull, which 
I mean, that was a pretty open and shut fight last June. That was my knockout of the year. Michael Chandler walloping Patricky Pitbull. Not as enticing of a rematch as there is to make. And we'll chat about this more with Brandon Gertz, just kind of for a homegrown Bellator fighter like a Brandon Gertz. And hey, look no further than the guy he just lost to, Adam Piccolotti. That's got to be frustrating to be sitting back on Saturday where Josh Thompson wins that fight after a year of inactivity he probably would have 100% gotten that title fight with Michael Chandler. And now, Patricky Pitbull could get the rematch after Chandler pretty handedly won that fight back in June. Um, but that's the nature of the game. If you have a name attached to you, if you have a following, that is going to put you a leg up on other guys, your Adam Piccolotti's of the world. Also on um, this past weekend's action, we had the UFC with a Sunday night show in Halifax going up against the NBA All-Star Game, which was no easy feat to have to garner an audience for. Still doing 907,000 viewers. And the peak number for that was about a million nineteen thousand, And that was for the Johnny Hendricks-Hector Lombard fight. Interesting that... That peak was not for Derek Lewis and Travis Brown, even though that was the promoted main event. I said last week I thought the Johnny Hendricks fight had the most intrigue for me just to see what version of Johnny Hendricks we would see, how he would look at middleweight, because that was must win for Johnny Hendricks. And he did get the win with a unanimous decision victory. Um, There was certainly some that uh, probably had it a very close fight, and it was. I had it 29-28 for Hendricks, giving Hendricks the second and the third. I thought the third was close, but Hendricks did enough at the end, and I thought the first was certainly Lombard's round as well. Johnny Hendricks at middleweight, I don't know if this is going to be something where long-term he's going to be able to have that success. I mean, his balance, his ability to withstand takedowns from Hector Lombard were excellent in this fight. I mean, he is a incredibly difficult individual to get down no matter what your size is Um, and I think any middleweight is going to have trouble taking down Johnny but he gives up a ton of size as they outlined on the broadcast his reach probably right at if not the lowest in the UFC middleweight division and when you're looking at the bigger names at middleweight and the bigger frames at middleweight um, against Johnny Hendricks it's pretty staggering the weight he is now competing at but my god was this man happy you heard him on the show last week he seemed to be in good spirits made the weight and then gets the win so it was a much needed revival for Johnny Hendricks and his fighting career. In the main event, Derek Lewis, after losing the first round, came back and just destroyed Travis Brown in the second. I thought a late stoppage on behalf of Mario Yamasaki, not stepping in there closer, um, or sooner, I should say. Travis Brown just ate some unnecessary shots. And when you counted the unanswered strikes uh, to both the head and the body, it was about 11 unanswered shots that Derek Lewis landed at the end of that fight, afterwards giving a a post-fight speech that many people were buzzing about afterwards. I mean, the guy certainly has a a charm to him. Um, You know, I don't know where everybody stands, but in in a week where we're looking at Chris Cyborg and how I'm going to try and tie these two together here, but You know, Chris Cyborg, it came out this week, she's being granted a retroactive therapeutic use exemption uh, for the diuretic that she was given by her physician after that brutal weight cut after her last fight in September of last year. She then tested positive for this diuretic during an out-of-competition test in December and had not disclosed that either when the test was taken. And they did the due diligence, and they believe she she did need this diuretic. She gets the retroactive TUE and will not face any sanctions from USADA. And there's been a lot of discussion about people that were throwing her name in the dirt, throwing accusations at Cyborg, and then it came out that this diuretic, she did need it. And if her damage was was hurt in all of this. And I couldn't help but have that in my mind as Derek Lewis, as entertaining as people find this guy, is on national TV calling Travis Brown a wife beater when essentially those are allegations that were made that there were no charges against Travis Brown. There was an investigation done by the UFC that didn't find any merit to the accusations. And yet it seemed everyone was fine with this on on national television of Derek Lewis, who, I mean, he's out there trying to gain people's attention, trying to be funny, uh, but this is still, I mean, 
if you're comfortable with that accusation being made, that's on you. But for me, when there is there was no findings that would support those accusations, I think that that certainly damages someone's reputation when you go on national TV and accuse someone of something so serious like that. All I'm saying is you want to be sure. Um, I think if you're if you're backing comments like that, uh, much less being the one to state them, as Derek Lewis did on that broadcast. Those were some of the news and notes from this past weekend. Also, uh, a number of Canadians uh, looking good on this card. Eamon Zahabi getting the win over Hedginaldo Vieira. Gavin Tucker, who may have been the uh, the standout of the Canadians, uh, winning all three rounds against Sam Cecilia. And Elias Theodoro defeating Cesar Fajeda. Uh, 29-28 scorecards for Theodoro, and now he is looking ahead, hoping to get the winner of Dan Kelly and Rashad Evans, who fight next weekend at UFC 209, coming up in Las Vegas. So I think uh, with that news and George St. Pierre's return, it's it looks like the UFC and their Canadian uh, cards slash fighters, um, it's a positive at this moment, but that is somewhat offset with the loss of Roy McDonald and Misha Serkinov, who is someone that has not come to any kind of agreement. Dana White has stated he is done with the UFC, and I think that would be an unfortunate loss to a light heavyweight division that was hit even harder this past week with not just Serkinov, but Nikita Krylov, who was offered a new deal, ends up uh, walking away from that deal. The UFC has given him a release. It looks like Nikita Krylov is gone. Ryan Bader is done with the UFC. In a division that is not all that deep, those are some significant losses at 205 pounds for the UFC's light heavyweight division. I think that Bellator would should be very aggressive in going after all three of these light heavyweights. And all of a sudden, you have the makings of a really interesting light heavyweight division that already has a Phil Davis as champion, that has King Mo, who certainly can come down from heavyweight and fight um at 205, which I think is a more natural weight for Lawal to be fighting at, um, that light heavyweight division all of a sudden has some interesting players if you were to nail down some of the light heavyweights that have apparently become free agents of late. One other thing coming out late today was the announcement. Joanna Jandracek, as expected, will defend her strawweight title against Jessica Andrade, UFC 211, on May the 13th in Dallas, Texas. So they are pairing the strawweight women's champion with the heavyweight championship fight on that card as Stipe Miocic will defend against Junior Dos Santos at the American Airlines Center in Dallas. So we are going to come back and we're going to hear from Brandon Gertz. He is going to be fighting at Bellator 172 next Friday night in Thackerville, Oklahoma. He's going to chat with us about his torn ACL last year, the recovery, tearing that ACL twice, the state of the Bellator lightweight division, why he's taking this fight at welterweight, and lots more coming up here with Brandon Gertz on the MMA Report. I think a lot of people looking forward to this fight. Uh, and this one came came together pretty quickly for you. Is that the main reason you're fighting at 170? Or are you, are you kind of testing the waters here at welterweight and seeing um, how you acclimate to the new weight? Uh, no, no, no. This is just kind of, you know, a fight A fight popped up and um, I wanted to fight right now. So this isn't me, you know, stepping up to, to welterweight for good. This is just kind of me stepping up because I, I really want to fight and I don't turn down a fight. It's been such a, a difficult year for you going back uh, just over a year now uh, when you tore your ACL. That was the second time you've dealt with that injury, correct? Yeah, man. It was definitely, like you said, a tough year for me. I mean, going going with the first one, that wasn't so hard mentally. The second one, I mean, when it happens twice, you know, within, you know, a year, it, uh, it's definitely a hard hurdle to get over. And it was the same knee both times? Correct. Wow. It's it, it's rather remarkable that when you hear an athlete tearing his ACL, I mean, that's typically six to 12 months uh, before they're even getting back into the gym. Here you were, you fought by November. Was that one of the most difficult uh, camps for you, just having that? Uh, there has to be that worry in the back of your mind of how far you, you push the knee and you're testing it and, and to get ready to fight by November. How did you feel mentally going into that fight with uh, Adam Piccolotti? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the thing right there. I mean, it, it was one of my probably toughest camps, you know, just trying to get over that mental hurdle. And that that's that's the biggest thing. I mean, physically, I was getting better and better every day, you know. But mentally, you just don't know, you know. Like, 
like I said, happens one time, okay, things happen. The second time, now you're now you're questioning yourself. You know, when you start questioning yourself, especially being a fighter, you're done. You know, when you're when you're questioning your ability and you're you're questioning if you're going to get hurt again, then then you're already losing. You know, so that like you said, it, it, it was a hard year. You know, on top of some other things that that went down that I had to push through, and I tried to, uh, you know, I tried to just shove this stuff down and dig deep. But you know, when you do something like that, it doesn't it doesn't uh, completely put away the problem. You know, so like you said, I, I fought probably about nine months after surgery, and I mean that had to do with I, I just really wanted to get back in there. You know, maybe my my uh, I should have waited a little bit, but uh, that's here here nor there. But um, now it's been a little bit over a year, and, you know, that fight at least gave me confidence that my knee, my knee is healed, you know. During camp, during everything, I was never really able to completely do stuff. It was, we spar, it was nobody kicked my leg, you know. We do that. Mm-hmm. I didn't even wrestle my whole camp just, just for the, the fact that I didn't want to, you know, the chance of injuring it, you know. So now we've just been able to do everything because after the Piccolotti fight, I mean, we we know now that my knee is good. I mean, he kicked the hell out of it. I had a bruised up leg. I mean, he tried his best, you know, to to test that knee, and it came out it came out with a green light. Do you almost look at at that fight as you know it goes down as a loss, but in many ways it was this mental hurdle you cleared by having that confidence in your knee and the fact that you were able to do that. Um, I, I would say a relatively quick turnaround after having such major reconstructive surgery. Do you look at that as almost a positive you can take out of that experience and, and having the faith in your knee after that performance? Yeah, absolutely. That was the that that was the major thing we took from that was that my knee was good to go, and um, that was pretty much what was holding me back. You know, like I said, through camp and even even stepping in that cage, it was it was there in the back of my mind. I wasn't sure about it. You know, all I was thinking about was one kick. Could my knee go out? This happens. You know, this is my this could be my last fight. That was all that was going through my head. You know, through the whole time. And and you just can't prepare like that. You can't step in the cage if you have doubts. When you step in the cage with doubts, you already lost. So, um, like you said, that was. That's what we took away from it. It was a, it was a huge relief, you know, however you want a mental hurdle to get over after the fight, knowing that my knee was good to go now. Do you train exclusively at 303 in Colorado, or do you move around? There's about a dozen gyms out there. It seems like it's a fighter's haven uh, in Colorado at the moment. Where, where are you primarily uh, training out of? Uh, my, my primary gym is uh, Genesis. Okay. Genesis is um, Genesis is uh, the old grudge. Right. We've uh, we've, we've changed locations, and uh, and uh, my head coach now is Jake Ramos, and he's now the owner of Genesis. So uh, three or three somewhere I go. Sometimes they got great jujitsu there, and that's where my good boy uh, Justin Gates is my main training partner. And, and what's going on with with Mister Gaethje? Any idea of where uh, Justin's going to end up? Oh. Man, I can't I can't throw that news out there. No, I, I'll put I'll put it out there that the, the world will probably know pretty damn soon. Ooh, let's put that out there. That that's a perfect he'll, tease. <laughs> he'll be he'll be with me next next weekend. Wow, so. he he'll be cornering you. Oh yeah, he'll be cornering me. Uh, in terms of this fight, not having that weight cut to dread at the end of this camp. I mean, is that a nice kind of? Uh, Something off your shoulders that, I mean, going into this fight at welterweight, uh, you don't have that, that big cut at the end of this entire thing. I mean, that's definitely what everybody keeps bringing up, that, you know, that I won't have the weight cut and whatnot. But to tell you the truth, I usually, you know, keep my weight pretty good. And the weight cut's not a, not a huge factor at 55. I, uh, you know, I'm eating clean. I do all the right stuff through my whole camp to make the weight cut really nothing, you know. So... To say that's going to be a big change, not really. The only difference is I'll probably be drinking the water on the scale. Well, that'll be nice. As you're looking ahead to uh, the rest of 2017, clearly you have your eyes on that lightweight picture. I mean, this is a division that, I mean, there is a, a lot uh, to look at and a lot of big names uh, popping up into this division. Um, as you look at, at the lightweight landscape, do you feel as someone that has been with Bellator all of these years 
do you feel that you almost have to do more work than say uh, a guy that for instance a Josh Thompson he hadn't fought for a year in Bellator and here had he won this past weekend he was in line for that title fight do you feel that there is more work that has to be done from the guys that are more kind of your homegrown Bellator lightweights oh yeah absolutely I mean you said it I, I consider myself a, a homegrown you know Bellator fighter so that's that's exactly what I consider myself, but um, it, it, it is. But it, I mean, you got to look at it as a this is a this is a business too, and name value is a massive thing. So can I, you know, get a little upset that Josh Thompson can step in there when I know I can take him out easily? Yes, but at the same time, I know it's a business, and we got to sell the fights. So them coming in with his with his that would have been a big fight, you know. Say he won, which he didn't, but mm-hmm. say he won. He just got knocked out by another homegrown Bellator fighter. I think that's telling you the amount of level of fighters that Bellator has. I, I think that that's something that that perception very much has has changed just over the last year where, I mean, everyone has this kind of preconceived notion that, you know, the uh, former UFC fighter comes in and they're just going to run through. That's hardly been the case when you look at your Benson Hendersons and and what's happened with a number of different guys, Josh Thompson included, that uh, do you feel that that perception has shifted now where uh, a lot of fighters like yourself are getting a lot more respect now once you're you're seeing guys taking on who fans perceive as the most elite. They're coming and Bellator has plenty of elite fighters. Yeah, yeah. And that, that right there is a funny subject to me. You see that all the time. Like you said, you see them coming in and they're like, oh, they're going to, okay, he's going to be the new champion. Oh, they're going to dominate all the Bellator fighters. They come in, they lose to a Bellator fighter. And then the next thing you hear, you hear is, oh, they're washed up. That's yeah. why they got cut by the UFC. They're washed up. They're done. You see that every single time. It's hilarious because it's just, it's just how the world works. But, um, like you said, it's, 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 to the hardcore fans, the people that aren't just the wishy-washy UFC fans, they know, they, they and they've seen it for years, they know the talent's here. And that's like you said, I think that perception is going to get a little less and less when we're seeing more of these names come over come over to Bellator and have great fights with other, you know, long-time Bellator fighters. You know, big, was that Bader? Bader, he's coming over here soon. Yep. We're going to see him test it, and you're going to see him have some great fights. So it's definitely a perception you're going to see change. But right now, it's funny, like you said, to bring that up, that you see them and they always say, oh, they're going to dominate. And then they come in and then one fight later, they're washed up. (laughs) Yeah, it's just you go from one extreme to the other instead of, I think, a lot of fighters that in Bellator just haven't gotten that respect. And I see that perception changing a lot. People look at Bellator that there's it, it was the same Brandon back in the day with Strike Force and with the WEC where people looked at them as inferior and realized, no, not not really. When you're talking about the top level of these respective weight classes, uh, th- these are elite fighters and they are spread out beyond just the UFC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're going to see it more and more now that, you know, uh, Bellator's owned by Viacom. Now that we're you know, fighters from the UFC have choices to come over here, you know, into Bellator or whatever. There never really was a choice before. It was pretty much UFC or fight the local scene. Now there's actual choices. Not, you know, Bellator is obviously, you know, we would have to say is the second, the second biggest, biggest fight organization. And, but we also had, you know, with the one FC and the Ryzen starting, it's, it's giving fighters opportunities. And it's also showing the rest of the MMA world that there is, other organizations that have amazing fighters too last thing here brandon this has been great as someone you know you're one of the few fighters that can compare the the different versions of bellator from the bjorn rebney era to today uh what do you like about the the presentation that that scott coker has injected with bellator now that we we've had uh over two years to look at scott coker's vision and how it's somewhat coming together now do you do you have a, a preference from the tournament days versus today um, you know, not just about the tournament, but the eyeballs that, that Scott Coker is bringing to Bellator, which is the biggest thing. You know, he's marketing us. And that's, and that's kind of how, you know, the UFC is why everybody thinks they're so much better is because they marketed their fighters. They did all that. The Beyond days, there wasn't much other than, other than putting out the, the toughest tournament in the world. That mm-hmm. was the only really market. They didn't market their fighters. They didn't have their fighters going out and doing fan expos. They didn't. They didn't have all these things that now Scott Coker is doing. He's bringing in these big names, you know, 
the Gracie, you know, all these people like that with big names. He's bringing them so that more eyeballs are coming to Bellator to say that UFC isn't the only promotion out there. People just kind of looked at, you know, when you when someone asked you, oh, do you do UFC? Like a lot of people couldn't put away, you know, what MMA is versus what UFC is. They just thought they were one of the same. You know, that, that, that was the only organization. Now with Scott, he's bringing more eyeballs. He's making these events skeptical. You know, he's doing stuff to make other people look at it and watch it, you know, and have fun time watching it. And that's, that's the big difference. Scott is bringing all these eyeballs. He's got all these connections with former strike force fighters, you know, having last fight I saw the Diaz brothers at the fights. That's going to be huge to any, any small fan that looks and is like, Oh, the Diaz brothers are at Bellator. You know, all of a sudden they're probably going to be like, are they fighting for Bellator? <laughs> you know how these people go. Yeah. You know, so that, that is what Scott's doing. And I think that's huge. He, he's making it more of a culture here now, you know, and bringing MMA up as a whole. We're very much looking forward to this fight. It's coming up next Friday night, March the 3rd in Thackerville, Oklahoma. It will be airing on Spike TV. Fernando Gonzalez taking on Brandon Gertz. And uh, Brandon, I want to thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this fight and uh, glad to see you back to 100% health. And I, I know a lot of people are looking forward to this fight. And what's ahead for you in, in 2017? I think the lightweight picture in Bellator is a really intriguing one coming up this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I go one fight at a time, but after, after I take out Fernando, you know, in, in great fashion and, uh, you know, show the world that I'm still here. And then, like you said, I'm 100% healthy now, physically, mentally. Um, I'm going to make a run for that title. And then I feel like by the end of the year, you're going to see me and Michael Chandler fighting. That was Brandon Gertz, who is fighting Fernando Gonzalez, a welterweight fight happening next Friday night. That's going down on Spike from Thackerville, Oklahoma. It will be headlined by Julia Budd and Marlus Kunin to crown the Bellator women's featherweight champion. And what an interesting switch that is now within the women's world of 145 pounds. We have the UFC creating a champion, Bellator creating a champion. Invicta just crowned a interim women's featherweight champion because Chris Cyborg still holds the Invicta version of the 145-pound title. So all of a sudden, you have all of these women's featherweight championships being created, and yet you wish in a perfect world that these divisions could all be amalgamated to form one cohesive division because I don't think there's one promotion that has a strong women's featherweight division. I mean, the UFC has a two-woman division if you count Holly Holm and Jermaine Durandamy as members of that division. And I guess Chris Cyborg, by default, is a 145-pounder. So there we have three women. Uh, we will see what the depth is at some of these uh, particular weight classes for the women. But that's a nice transition to a man that is a pioneer when it comes to women's mixed martial arts. He promoted the very first all-women show back in April of 2002. He is Hook and Shoot founder and promoter Jeff Osborne. And it's going to be the Hook and Shoot Farewell Show that's going down next Saturday night, March the 4th, in Evansville, Indiana, which has been the home of Hook and Shoot for over two decades. Uh, you can look it up on Facebook. Just simply search for a Hook and Shoot Farewell Show if you happen to be nearby or want to make the trek to Evansville. It's a historical promotion, one that was instrumental in the, in the development of many different female fighters who fought there, the likes of... Caitlin Young and Tara LaRosa and Debbie Purcell. I mean, you can go through a who's who of women in the sport. And this predated the UFC promoting women. It predated Invicta FC. And it was well before Gary Shaw uh, introduced the women at Elite XC in 2007. So it was a pleasure to have uh, Jeff Osborne back on the program. Here he is chatting about the decision to call it a day with promotion for mixed martial arts and the hook and shoot organization, how it came together. And we even dive into some professional wrestling discussion as well. So here he is, Jeff Osborne on the MMA Report. It's a pleasure to have this man joining us. He is promoting the final hook and shoot event after 22 years. It is going down on Saturday night, March the 4th in Evansville, Indiana at 7 p.m. And joining us now, the founder, the promoter, the man who is most associated, I feel, with the hook and shoot brand. He is Jeff Osborne, who joins us. Jeff, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks a lot for this. Hey, John. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. This was, I'm sure, something that... Uh, probably has been in your mind for a long time of the idea of wrapping up hook and shoot. What was it that, that led you to this final decision to officially 
uh, hang it up when it comes to promoting this company that, I mean, hardcore MMA fans have been following for over two decades at this point? Uh, it's, it's just a culmination of many, many things. I think everybody, uh, if you do something for 20 years, it, it kind of loses its touch and loses, uh, the luster a little bit. And I just feel like I've done everything I possibly could. And after the big MMA boom, uh, which I still consider to be around 2005 and six, uh, it just hasn't been the same for me after, uh, you know, 2009, 2010, when everything blew up on television. And, uh, I believe we're at a oversaturation point and all these new fans don't take into consideration the history that's, you know, behind MMA and where it all came from. I mean, it just kind of beats you down after a while and history seems to be forgotten and it just just wears you down that's where i'm at at this point when did you first sense that was it was this years back was this something recent for you or is is this just been something building for for a while that you've noticed this trend and kind of a you don't have that that link to history that i feel you're accurate in that sense with a lot of fans that have come into the sport over the last number of years and i i think it all started when uh the ultimate fighter got picked up on television um it changed the dynamic of what people perceive a fighter to, to be uh i i think that first season the, nothing's ever going to top it you could you could film that thing a billion times and you're never going to get a Forrest Griffin or Stephen Bonner match or a star of that magnitude out of it ever again and if if you can look pass or look at the last 10 or 15 seasons or however many they're on. I, I can't really name one single fighter who's blown up like those two guys did. And, uh, as I was saying, it changed the dynamic of the fighter or which everyone saw this on TV to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a fighter. And it became just a cardio contest to a lot of people. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I looked at that show and every single fighter on there was just shaved headed with a goatee wearing camo trunks and covered in tattoos and no one, it, it just became robotic. And I think it was around that time that that's the second, third, fourth season. Uh-huh. Uh, once they started incorporating that second generation of fighters off television, it just was downhill for me. Everyone was a fighter, and it wasn't special anymore. What did you specifically look for in fighters when you were were trying to uh, schedule guys who were maybe early in their careers? What were those those key intangibles that you felt would connect with an audience that you'd be able to to market, sell tickets towards? Were, were, were there any patterns amongst fighters that you felt connected better than others? Uh, back in the day, I wasn't uh, so concerned with selling tickets. But uh, after that point of, you know, like the TV, the Ultimate Fire and everything, it just became a business to me. And it wasn't special to me anymore. But, I mean, I still, I look at what camp a fighter comes from, how hard I know they're training mentally and physically. I know that sounds cliche and corny. But if you tell me, like, hey, I've been training in my basement, you know, I punch a heavy bag and I got some four foot by four foot mats I train on with my kids or something like that. It's kind of a letdown, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not like the old days where you had a team of 10 or 12 guys in your gym and you, you work your ass off to get where you were. And, uh, it's just a work ethic issue. And I run into that all the time now of guys who just have no work ethic whatsoever and I'll kind of scope them out on Facebook, kind of like a private detective or something would do. And I see these guys who've never set foot in a real legitimate gym or had one single fight. And they're calling their occupation is MMA fighter. I'm like, what the hell has <laughs> happened here? But that's your, you have no idea what it is to be an MMA fighter. And once again, everybody was, uh, a uh, thought in their head can be a fighter. 
but it's so hard to keep a show together now that it, it it becomes a giant stressful headache or, you know, I remember, you know, it wasn't even a decade ago where we were just turning people away. It's like, man, we have too many fighters here. Wow. And then the, uh, you know, the, everything blew up. There was 10 times, 20 times the amount of shows, maybe even more. And people were just happy fighting on their own shows and being comfortable and never having to fight a reasonable opponent. And that's something I never did with our local guys is I gave them the toughest damn guys I could find them. And they never complained about it once. And all these other shows open where, you know, these gyms, they never wanted to leave their own city because they didn't have to because they got to handpick their opponents and do what they needed to do. But it's just a, a burnout point for me right now. I don't know what... The, what um your experience is, I mean, w- when it comes to promoting shows without national television for, for promoters that are just promoting locally and it featuring rising talent, is it viable in 2017 for, for those promoters? I know here up in Canada, in Ontario, I mean, it's just, it's cost prohibitive that y- it's just impossible to make a profit off of a show that that you're running in this particular province if you're not the ufc is that kind of the trend we're going to see where it's going to be a lot of these promotions where it's it's managers that are involved in helping their own fighters and these loss leaders to get their own fighters fights so that they can get to a ufc or a bellator yeah i mean financially i remember radio stations television and uh our local cable providers coming to me going, Hey, we have advertising packages. And I just looked at them like they were idiots. Like I'm selling out every single show and I have to do nothing. And, uh, last show, which was in September, uh, I lost money for the first time in probably, probably eight years. Wow. And I said, once I got to that point, it's, it's over. And I wanted it to end then, but the, the only reason I didn't end it at that point was that the uh, a lot of the fighters, I just sprung it on everybody that night saying, this is it, this is the last one, I'm never doing it again. And they say, well, how could you do this? You know, we want to be a part of the last show. You know, you have to do one more. And that's the only reason I'm doing it is basically for the fighters. But financially, you know, it's it's reached a point where, for me, it's it's not even feasible for me to do anymore. I have other ventures I'm doing and things that make me happy, and this uh, doesn't necessarily make me happy anymore. I, I love the people. I love the journey I've been on, and uh, it's it's the people and the parties. That's about all. If I could skip through the fight show and the headache moving up to it and... and hang out with all my friends, <laughs> I'd, that'd be great, but not that easy. It, was it ever a, a source of frustration for you as you could, you could hear, you could run this, this event, you could be profitable, and then you would see these juggernauts like an Elite XC who spent so much money, and here you are looking at like advertising packages that make no sense to spend money on, and here you had giant offices all these executives, these overhead costs that were just astounding at the time that, I mean, the, the, these promotions that would come up with just these so much startup capital and would burn through it in record time. It was, it was funny. I was, I can't remember what radio show I was on. It may have been a serious satellite radio show, but somebody said in comparison to elite XC, how much more money did you make? last year than they did. And I say, well, at least $43 million more. <laughs> so that's what they had lost in one single year. And I just never understood these guys would hire people with virtually no MMA background, no one with any kind of passion. It was just dollar signs to them. And even to a degree, when I was with Bodog, they would, Hire college graduates, you know, it was a sheet of paper. But when it came down to anyone knowing about MMA, some people there just had no idea what they were doing or what they were a part of, but they, they got in 
got the job for having a college degree and stuff like that. And I firmly believe, just like I believe to be an MMA ref, I believe you, you should have some serious training and or you should have been a fighter before, and I'll stick by that forever. But uh, like you said, that big boom, these guys throwing millions and millions and millions of dollars around but never treating it properly was just it was discouraging to me because I would love to have that opportunity to run a company like that. I I certainly remember back in uh, November of 2007 when you ran the, the Bodog Fight Women's Tournament and that Monday coming off of that show, I mean, it just seemed that everyone was talking about this incredible one-night performance uh, by Caitlin Young defeating Susie Smith, Misha Tate, and Patty Lee all in under a minute. Is that one of the shows that when you're thinking of, of the pantheon of hook and shoot cards that you promoted, that that, that was one that, that certainly stood out for you as a, a memorable night with, uh, I mean, that's an incredible performance in one night. Uh, it, it was amazing. I, I literally had no idea who was going to win that tournament. I had never met one, a, a single one of those women before that night, or before that, the weigh-ins. And, uh, to me, that's the last great show that I ever had. And nothing's going to, you know, at this point, nothing can top it. Uh, it, it was just a, an amazing night for me, like something special had happened. And you knew something special had happened when you left that building. I mean, it's very rare, and this is not to, and Caitlin Young said this before, it's very rare for a woman to knock out another woman like the men do, but you can kick a chick in the face and knock her out. <laughs> and that's what, that's what she did that night. And I'll never forget Caitlin Young saying that comment before all of that went down. So, yeah, to me, and even going back prior to that, of course, the biggest biggest show for me is always going to be the uh, first all-women's show in 2002. Yep. And on paper – the 2004 all women show barely gets any kind of uh, notoriety, but it was just packed full of unbelievable women who went on to be champions of so many organizations. What was the reaction you had around that time in 2002 when you announced you were going to promote an all women's card? Did you, did you hear people with dissension towards this idea? Was there any negativity towards it at the time in 2002? Because God knows all the, the criticisms that came years later. And I think overlooking a, a, a huge pioneer in yourself here who went through all of these, these historical moments that, you know, sadly don't get remembered as often because of a, a newer audience that isn't educated to this. Yeah. I, and, and a mutual friend of ours, Paul Lazenby has always told me, why do you not stand up for yourself? It's like you, you kept women's MMA alive during its darkest days. And I believe a lot of the women would have just stopped fighting because there was no avenue to do it. And uh, it, it really does burn me that some of this is forgotten. And the comment made the other night on the Bellator broadcast, mm -hmm. a slap in the face to all those women who who would go to these various shows and fight for free or fight for 100 or $200 back in the day when they were treated like a sideshow. You know, Scott Coker isn't the king of the king of the the women's mma movement and you know i'm not either the women are i was just a guy who believed in a uh you know i saw i was i was looking 10 years down the road uh that's that's all i was doing and i, I was very fortunate to uh gain the trust of a lot of these women and eventually got them very good paydays with bodog and other organizations but even my partners at the time, uh, weren't even going to come to the show. Like, are you, you know, what, what's the deal? Do you not, it, and it was all thrown on me. Partners didn't believe it. There was even women fighters. Like I go back to Aaron Towhill who, you know, said this fight's never going to happen. Her manager at the time, I can't even remember his name. The, the stuff they were saying was so idiotic that, uh, they ended up eating their own words when this show happened. But uh, I think a lot of people just couldn't believe it. But I, when I set out to do something, I'd do it. 
Is it? Do you take any solace that you know when, when a comment that, such as Jimmy Jimmy Smith's from this past weekend, when that is broadcast? I mean, there is a contingent of people online that whenever some of that happens, your name and hook and shoot does pop up by people that were following at that time and can at least get that information out there because. I don't think anyone should necessarily have to slight Scott Coker or any of the others, but history is history. And I mean, that 2002 card, that was a historical night in mixed martial arts that uh, that history needs to be out there. Yeah, you know, it's nothing against Scott. I just, you know, whenever I was on the mic, I tried not to say anything that would come back and haunt me. I think that was one of my things that, you know, I could still take to the grave with me is, you know, anybody out there could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I said anything stupid during a UFC broadcast, but uh, not saying that comment was stupid. Maybe he was told to say that. I've been told to say things by Zufa that I refused to say uh, back in the day. But uh, I don't know. Maybe it was taken out of context or, or whatever, but... A lot of the women messaged me after that. Even some who have fought for Elite X, or not Elite XC, but Strike Force, saying, you know, this is a joke. I can't believe anyone would ever say this. But, you know, I, 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 I'm at the point where I don't care. I can accept it. And I believe MMA history is only about five years long max anymore. And that's, that's how people roll, I guess. Did that at all go into the thinking when when you made the deal with with UFC Fight Pass to to sell the library, the idea that at least here on this platform, these fights can live? Or was it just strictly a business deal that you viewed it upon at the time? It was both. uh, The first thought in my mind was, oh, my God, someone can finally do something with these women's shows I've shot. I mean, there's even shows that you don't even know about from, I want to say, 2009, 2010 that had all women's tournaments in them. Uh, they were amateurs, but a lot of those amateurs went on, uh, you know, to be on the all-women ultimate fighter and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but for me, they were a bunch of tapes sitting up in my uh, editing room for, you know, Some of them almost two decades, and I've never touched them. Uh, The passion was obviously not there for me anymore to to produce the uh, live events and put them on DVDs because DVDs a dead market anyway now. And I said, "Wow, I would I would have given these things away for next to nothing." But the the money they came at me with, and from what I'm told, I was one of the first deals that they did. To where they may have paid me too much or whatever, but I was very, very, very happy, even though I'm not allowed to talk about or disclose the amount of funds. But uh, <laughs> it, it was nice. It was life changing. And wow. I'm just glad that looking back, the, the all women's tournament from 2000, uh, 2005, which no one's ever seen, uh, from 2008, no one's ever seen. They're all going to see the light of day. I'm very happy for that and happy that I, that these women are going to be able to finally see their fights after some of them after 10 years. A, a weird question I have that I've just always thought of. I mean, we see so many MMA groups that have popped up and it's always, you know, the three letters. And, and that's why I always enjoyed Hook and Shoot. It was a name that was different. Was it something that you put? Uh, a lot of thought into did it just come to mind was there any story behind just just the name because it certainly deviated from your typical abc lettered mma organization yeah there's no f and there's no c in there which is great but uh you know it's it's all from pro wrestling real pro wrestling i always want to encourage fighters to uh be an individual to stand out as much as they could and you've seen how well it works for people like conor mcgregor uh, Ronda Rousey, who aren't afraid to push the envelope and amplify their personalities for the camera, for the people. Uh, but hooking is obviously an age old wrestling and pro wrestling term. Uh, shooting. If you shoot on somebody in pro wrestling, a shoot is a term that means real. So basically for me, it was real pro wrestling. 
that's that's where those terms come from. And I was always proud of the name that I didn't have to have a X or a F or a C in there. And it just was kind of different than anything else. Is there any pro wrestling you still keep up on uh, today? Oh, I follow everything. I, uh, I'm a big New Japan fan. Uh, still watch WWE every week with my 11-year-old daughter. Uh, she became obsessed with it. Um, but once, once they screwed Daniel Bryan over at WrestleMania a few years ago, she said, who writes this crap? And kind of <laughs> turned her back on it. So, <laughs> but still love it. Still, still follow it. I watch, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday every week on, uh, WWE and of course their network. I'm a subscriber of the network wrestling. It, it'd never leave me. You know, that's what got me to where I am right now was, you know, going in the very Coliseum at the age of four and seeing, you know, Jerry Lawler and all these people pass through there through the years. And for me to get my first sell out in that place, which I believe was in 2001, was surreal to me because I, I had watched guys like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Sting. A lot of those guys had their first it was probably their third in ring match in Evansville, Indiana. Wow. Which is, again, so surreal for me to even imagine that happening there. That I'm, I'm very partial to the Coliseum and it's, it's a hundred year history. It's a hundred years old, uh, this year. So, how, how did Jim Helwig and Steve Borden look in match number three? I mean, you probably, oh my God. you probably couldn't have I mean, forecasted their careers at that point. It was, if you can go look them up on, uh, YouTube in Memphis, they, here's the, here's the deal. Bill Dundee was the booker of the territory at the time. Mm -hmm. Bill Dundee turned himself heel so he would not have to work, uh, Thing or, or warrior. That's how terrible they were. They were they were gigantic genetic robots who could not pull any kind of punches or kicks or strikes. But amazingly, they were able to uh, you know market the hell out of those two. And it was, I mean, if you see any of that that early stuff, yeah, it's uh, you probably couldn't have imagined that they would have had significant runs uh, throughout their careers. Oh, it's, you know, I, I hate to get off track on pro wrestling, but I remember watching the Memphis television on my local market and the, the most kind of bizarre thing I've ever seen was there's an old school wrestler, Phil Hickerson, and yep. he's just kind of a hillbilly, typical Southern wrestler with a big barrel belly. And they did an angle with Phil Hickerson coming out. And, uh, you know, there's Sting and Warrior out there doing just a terrible interview. And he said, you guys are green. You don't know how to wrestle. And all you know how to do is to stick them steroids in them booties. And you can <laughs> look that up on YouTube, folks. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Jeff, I, I want to thank you very much. Once again, the, the final hook and shoot card is going down next Saturday night in Evansville. Uh, for those listening that maybe are, are going to make the trek for this final event, where can they go for more information on the show? Uh, we just have a Facebook page now. Um, just look up hook and shoot Evansville on uh, Facebook. A lot of information on there. Uh, I just want to you know, take time out and thank you, John. You do a hell of a lot for this industry, and I think it goes unappreciated uh, a lot of times. And you're you're one of the best guys in the biz, man. Uh, I appreciate I, it. I really appreciate that uh, coming from you, Jeff. Uh, very, very kind of you. Are you and Paul ever going to get together for the Bodog book? Oh my God! I'll I'll invest. If we do, <laughs> if we do I probably won't wear pants riding that either. So. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> That's still. I'd love I, to do it. You, you have to go back into our archives because the last time we had Jeff on, we had him and Paul, and for 45 minutes, they just shared Bodog fight stories. And it was among my favorite shows I have done to this date. I mean, a promotion that <laughs> should never be forgotten. The, the legacy. It was short, but my goodness, was it, uh, did it make, make use of its time while it was still in existence? The, the single most fun time of my life, and uh, I was actually talking about this last night. I'm supposed to go on Chael Sonnen's podcast 
at some point, and I remember during a live broadcast of Bodog, it was actually in Canada, and I don't know why this was. It was USA versus Russia, live from Canada. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I remember this card. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, dude, I said, Chael Sonnen needs to make uh, pillows for his fans because he's putting everyone to sleep right now. And you, you fast forward a few years later, and again, Chael Sonnen uh, comes from the Pacific Northwest, and that was a big pro wrestling territory, and he kind of adapted uh, – the interview skills of a wrestler who called himself the grappler back in the day. And uh, sure enough, Chael Sonnen went from being a mid carter to main eventing multiple UFCs and, you know, wasn't so boring anymore. So, yeah. Like, I do. I don't regret saying that because he was terribly boring back then, but uh, he evolved. Sorry, Chael. I, I think even he would uh, admit he had that kind of uh, that come to Jesus moment in his career. I mean, later in the 2000s, and you saw that that transformation and the the rapid change uh, in, in Chael Sonnen, this guy that was. I mean, you you just look at before and after. I mean, he was someone that clearly that light bulb went off. Oh yeah, I, I wish it would go off for more and more fighters out there who are just kind of stuck in the middle. Just kind of take control of your career. Be different. Be an individual. You know, be who you are outside of uh, outside of fighting. You know, if you're if you go to the club wearing a fur coat and gigantic Elton John sunglasses, by all means, do that on your walk to the cage. I mean, come on, show me something different. <laughs> Yeah, it's something. I mean, when you even look, watch a UFC broadcast now, and they'll, you know, they cut out the entrances. I mean, that's you know, for their their televised cards, it's it's the main eventers that get their entrance, and the, and that's it. It's a huge part uh, of the entire package. That I think a lot of these guys, they have their athletic backgrounds that that is all they're focused on, and not the second you walk out of that curtain, it's you know, that's your presentation. That's so much of the game. And it seems a lot of fighters, Jeff, it's right towards the end of their careers that that kind of goes off and they realize this and what's successful. Yeah, like they, I should have done this a long time ago. And fighters, don't be afraid to take that chance because, I've, I mean, there's been fighters fight for me. And by the end of the night, I, I can't even remember how they won, how they lost. I can't even remember their name. That's not what you want. Not from a, a promoter, you know. Promoter standpoint or fan standpoint, you want them to remember everything about you. And a lot of times I say it's not what happens inside the cage or inside of the ring. It's what you do before, what you say after. And that's a, a piece of advice I can't stress enough. Well, Jeff, uh, I've taken up a lot of your time here, so I want to thank you again. And, and thank you for all you've done in the sport. I really hope that a lot of people uh, do uh, remember the the legacy that, that you have that you have uh, within this sport. And it's something that uh, the sport as a whole can do a better job of, of, of acknowledging that history and getting it out there. And I hope you're not a stranger. I hope we can have you back on the show. I hope you don't divorce yourself from MMA. I'd love to have you on the chat, MMA and pro wrestling in the future. Uh, anytime, man. So, like I said, sorry to ramble. No, I, I love it. Talking with people like you and I can't stop. So, well, it's uh, always great to catch up with you, Jeff, all the best with the show. And we will definitely chat with you in the near future. Thank you very much, man. That was Jeff Osborne, the final Hook and Shoot show going down next Saturday night, March the 4th in Evansville, Indiana. Once again, you can go search for that on Facebook. Just type in Hook and Shoot Farewell Show. You'll be able to find all the details for that happening at the Evansville Coliseum. And a big thank you to Jeff for joining us. It's great to catch up with him, and I'm sure we will be having him back in the near future to chat uh, many different topics uh, that we could uh, go hours on. So that's going to bring an end to the show. I want to thank both Jeff Osborne and Brandon Gertz for joining us over the past hour. Next week, we'll be getting set for UFC 209. That's going down a week from Saturday as they return to the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. Tyron Woodley and Stephen Thompson having their rematch for the welterweight title. And Khabib Nurmagomedov and Tony Ferguson for the interim lightweight championship as well. Uh, plus Bellator. We mentioned the 174 card. That's going down on Friday night. Lots to discuss next week, and uh, we will speak with you then. You can follow me on Twitter at I am John Pollock. You can subscribe to this show, The MMA Report with John Pollock on iTunes. If you happen to leave us uh, a review of the show on iTunes, that's greatly appreciated. It helps with the uh, promotion of the show and, you know, for search functions and 
being on the iTunes Sports and Recreational list. It's always a helpful to get the the word out there about the program so thank you for tuning in and we'll be back next week chatting all the latest in mixed martial arts thank you and we'll speak with you next time